And now I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Ernie, who is going to be introducing the seminar and getting us started today. Ernie? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, um, so uh, thank you for joining us for this virtual SLU collaborative seminar. We're going to get started uh, with today's program. And Oops, sorry. Am I? Oops. There we go. Sorry, I was on the wrong slide there. Um, uh, so this is our agenda for today. Um, I'm Ernie Coffey, the Director of Operations and Administration for the Allen Institute for Immunology. Uh, the Allen Institute is delighted to host three outstanding speakers for today's event who will each be speaking on their unique perspectives on research with human subjects. You'll notice we have time for questions at the end of our program for all speakers, and we'll have time to take a few questions after each presentation as well. There we go. Uh, as a reminder, uh, please use the Q&A panel to enter your questions for the presenters. At the beginning of your question, please indicate who your question is for, or if your question is for more than one speaker, um, the Allen Institute staff members will be monitoring the Q&A and will share selected questions with the speakers at the end of each session or in the final Q&A session. Uh, we will get to as many questions as we can. Um, we've also made available a chat window uh, where you can converse with other participants and share comments about your own research. But please do not enter your questions for the panelists in the chat window. Our Q&A moder moderator will only be able to share your questions uh, from the Q&A panel. Uh, the Allen Institute is proud to be hosting this installment of the SLU Collaborative Seminar. For those of you not already familiar with what we do, the Allen Institute is a biological sciences nonprofit located in Seattle, Washington, with focused research areas in neuroscience, cell biology, and immunology. We also support cutting edge research uh, across the world with uh, the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group. Across our institutes, our scientific process is focused on tackling complex, broad, hard problems in fundamental sciences. Our approach is guided by three principles, which I'll return to in, in a moment. Our work generates data, knowledge, and analysis tools, all of which we share publicly. Oops. Oh, my mouse is a little sensitive. There we go. Our core principles that guide our, all of our work are our team, big, and open science. For team science across the Allen Institute for Brain Science, Cell Science, and Immunology, we conduct our science as interdisciplinary teams who contribute specialized expertise to a central complex goal. For big science, our projects operate at scale, capturing robust definitive data. To date, the divisions of the Allen Institute have collectively captured about eight petabytes of data, or 1.7 million DVDs worth. For open science, our data is made publicly available through our open data portals at brainmap.org and allencell.org. As the newest institute, the Allen Institute for Immunology has not yet released data, but we're looking forward to joining our peers in the brain science and cell science divisions. I and the Allen Institute, uh, the Allen Institute speaker for today, uh, Troy Torgerson, are part of the Allen Institute for Immunology one of the three scientific divisions of the Allen Institute. Our research uses flexible, high-throughput methodologies to collect comprehensive data on the state of the immune system in a variety of human subject cohorts. We not only examine disease conditions of the immune system, both from hyperactivity leading to autoimmune conditions and from hypoimmunity leading to chronic infections or cancers, but also healthy individuals as well. The Allen Institute is proud to collaborate with UW Medicine and Fred Hutch to produce the SLU Collaborative Seminar Series. This is a quarterly seminar series with the goal of fostering networking and idea sharing among the research and technology partners in the SLU neighborhood. 
Our, our seminars are intended to be a starting point for collaborations that will utilize the resources of our scientific neighborhoods to drive exciting research. The seminar host rotates among UW Medicine, the Allen Institute, and Fred Hodge, with one speaker from each participating institution at each seminar. We hope that this virtual seminar will help maintain those connections during this time, as well as to share some exciting research happening at our institutions. I'm excited to present our speakers for today's event. Uh, first, uh, uh, we have Dr. Troy Torgerson, uh, and he is the Director of Experimental Immunology here at the Allen Institute for Immunology. Prior to joining the Allen Institute, he was on the faculty at the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital. Troy's research has focused on characterizing genetic mutations that cause the immune system to become dysregulated, leading to autoimmunity and susceptibility to, to infections. He obtained his MD and a PhD in immunology from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and completed a pediatrics residency and fellowship training in pediatric rheumatology and immunology at the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Chris Goss is a professor at UW Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and in Pediatrics. He is also the Associate Medical Director of Cystic Fibrosis Therapeutics Development Network. He received his MD from the University of Colorado School of Medicine and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Prior to joining the faculty at UW, he completed a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Washington, where he also received his MS in epidemiology. And then we will have Dr. Parth Shah, who is an assistant professor in the Public Health Sciences Division in Hutchinson Institute for Cancer Outcomes Research at Fred Hutch. He received his PharmD from the University of Southern California and his PhD in health behavior from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he is still a research fellow. His research focuses on how pharmacies can be better used to provide cancer prevention and care services to their communities. His research interests also include medical and end of life decision making and improving palliative care. And so with that, with those introductions, I'll now hand this over to our first speaker, uh, Troy Torgerson. Thanks, Ernie. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. Um, wait for my slides to come up here. All right, I think we're ready. Um, all right, so I wanted to talk, uh, you know, we're supposed to be talking about uh, the use of um, human uh, samples, human material in research and, and humans participating in research. And I wanted to talk about the idea that um, this crazy idea of studying the human immune system in humans, which um, is, you know, sounds like a crazy topic and a crazy title, but, but um, the history of immunology um, really is that um, human immunity, immunity has really been studied in mice for the, for the most part uh, and in, in other animal models. So a lot of what we know about the human immune system has really been derived from various animal models and particularly mice. Um, knockout mice, uh, normal mice that have been manipulated in various ways, humanized mice, there's a whole host of uh, animal models that have been used and, and the mouse has really been the workhorse for this. And over the years, we've really relied as immunologists heavily on the mouse to really reflect then um, what we think is happening in humans. And that was partly out of necessity because we didn't have tools available to really do this effectively in humans and and I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. Um, mice really have served as a stand-in uh, for humans in, in many cases and uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages about of, of studying the immune system in mice versus humans are, are laid out below here. So Mice, of course, are, are inbred, and so they, um, you know, you can, as you design an experiment, you can design an experiment where you are most likely to get a fairly consistent response uh, in the population that you're studying. In contrast, of course, humans are outbred and um, have many diverse responses, and I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later in the talk as I share a little bit of data. 
Um, the other thing about mice is, of course, you can engineer them to uh, have to be designed the way you want. You can knock out genes, you can knock in genes, you can knock in reporter molecules, uh, whereas humans, uh, that's strongly discouraged, actually, uh, in most cases. Uh, and so we, we really are not able to engineer human systems very readily, uh, other than in the cases of things like CAR T cell therapy and, and things like that. Um, in mice, of course, they're plentiful. Uh, the samples are available for study, which makes things easy. Uh, whereas humans, uh, you, you have to work around the schedules of the humans uh, that you want to study, and that can be complicating uh, to research efforts. Um, it's easy to harvest component parts of mice for studies, meaning that you can, uh, in, in mice that you're studying, they can essentially be dissected, taken apart. You can study the, what's going on in the lymph nodes, the lungs, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, et cetera. Whereas in humans, um, we are much more limited in our ability to study the component parts. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, um, there have been post-mortem studies that have been done. Uh, biopsy studies now are uh, uh, have been done, but but of course biopsies typically don't yield a lot of material, and that has created challenges for the study of human immunology in humans. Um, and then, uh, of course, with mice, you can control their environment, you control their exposures, their diet. Uh, humans are uh, more difficult to control their environment and their exposures and their diet, uh, despite efforts to, to do that. So doing uh, human immunology research in humans uh, is, can be difficult. Now, the interesting thing is that, of course, in mice, uh, the, the, the approach that, we, we, that has generally been taken is that you make a mouse model, whether it's a knockout mouse, a knock-in mouse, et cetera, and then you go searching uh, for a phenotype. So you may modify a gene and then you go searching for the phenotype that that gene causes. Whereas with human research, uh, at least in uh, related to the immune system, typically what we're doing is we start on this end of the spectrum where the interesting phenotypes make their way to our clinics where we see these patients and characterize them clinically and then with, of course, uh, genetic tools now uh, readily available, we work backwards to try and find any gene defects or gene modifiers that may cause or lead to the phenotype that had been observed in clinic. And so um, the, the, uh, these sort of have, have sort of work in different directions uh, and, and create some, some uh, challenges uh, in doing that. Now, in some cases, the mouse models have been very good surrogates for humans. And I just will point to this one example. There are many examples. This is IL-10 or IL-10 receptor deficiency uh, in mice. Uh, it causes a severe GI tract inflammatory disease, severe inflammatory bowel disease when you knock out interleukin-10 or interleukin-10 receptor. And uh, it turns out that in, in, in 2015, uh, there were humans identified who have mutations either in the IL-10 receptor complex or in IL-10, and their dominant clinical phenotype is with a severe early onset inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so uh, phenotypically, the mice and humans matched very well. And in this really elegant study by S Scott Snapper's group at Harvard, they showed that um, a, a lot of the inflammatory disease in the bowel was driven by inflammatory monocytes that um, if you blocked interleukin-1 in these mice that had IL-10 or IL-10 receptor knockouts, it seemed to decrease the inflammatory response in the, in the gut. Um, uh, and then they went on to show in a couple of patients with IL-10 receptor deficiency that if they treated them with, inter, with IL-1 blockade, uh, with uh, FDA-approved IL-1 blocking drugs, they also saw a clinical improvement in their gut disease, which had really was kind of novel in this disease because these, pa these patients tend to be very recal recalcitrant to, to therapy. So um, that's been, obviously, there, there are many examples of, of where things uh, match up quite well, uh, but then there are also plenty of examples where they don't. And in this, this study that really has become uh, very well known now, uh, in, it's published in, from uh, David Maspis' lab, lab in, uh, in Nature in 2016, they really showed that mice uh, that were, lab mice that were kept in a uh, laboratory 
environment um, and, and housed there, really their immune systems never really fully matured. And in fact, their, their immune system looked more like a human neonate. Um, whereas if you took uh, mice from a pet store, uh, they had a, an immune system that looked more like uh, a, a normal human uh, in terms of its both being both naive and mature and, and a normal maturation. And uh, they showed that if you took lab mice and you incubated, you know, incubated them or you co-housed them with dirty pet store mice, that about 20% of the, the lab housed mice just died. Um, but the remaining mice uh, being now having the, the microbiome presumably of these pet store mice, uh, then did their, their immune systems did mature appropriately. And so, you know, this is one of many examples again, where the mouse models uh, may not uh, perfectly reflect what we're seeing in humans. So the main challenge in, in human studies really has been the ability to study the limited samples that we're able to get. Of course, you can draw blood, but you can only draw so much blood at a time. You know, uh, I'm a pediatrician and on the pediatric side, typically we are limited to draw, to being able to draw a maximum of Two, two milliliters of blood per kilogram um, uh, at a particular time, and, and there's limits on how many times you can do that in a, in a month, for instance. And so you can imagine in a small child, if you're wanting to study the immune system in an infant, for instance, that does not leave you with much blood volume to, to be able to study. And um, then at the same time, of course, uh, biopsy materials, uh, if you do a biopsy, typically those, the volumes of those and the numbers of cells in those biopsies is, is small, which has created challenges with being able to really study the human immune system in humans. And so there have really been a number of technologies that have been refined and, and have evolved over the last uh, few decades, and particularly over the last decade, that have really now facilitated the ability to study the, the human immune system in, in humans. One of those are, of course, high parameter flow cytometry, where now we can do you know, 20, 30, 40 uh, markers in a single flow cytometry um, experiment. Um, there are single cell nucleic acid technologies, such as RNA sequencing, attack sequencing, et cetera, uh, that have facilitated the ability to study small numbers of cells in a very detailed way. Um, and then there are high-plex sensitive proteomic assays that are being now used to study things such as um, plasma proteomics, et cetera. Each of these adds a dimension to our study of human immunology. So of course, flow cytometry in CYTOF allows us to look at the types of cells that are in circulation or in a tissue sample, uh, look at the activation state of those cells, et cetera. Single cell sequencing allows us to, to uh, study the transcriptome of those cells uh, and attack sequencing, the epigenetic um, uh, standing of those, uh, uh, of those cells. Uh, plasma proteomics, for instance, we can look at plasma in these, and there's a, there's a, num a number of uh, commercial platforms like Olink and, and others that are being used to study this. And then, of course, there's the metadata from patients, which adds an, an additional dimension. Now, in addition to all of these dimensions of studying human immunology, what we're trying to do at the, at the uh, Allen Institute for Immunology is add an additional dimension to these studies, which is the dimension of time. And so most of our studies, are, uh, in addition to employing these uh, high-plex technologies, um, employs a longitudinal analysis scheme so that we are sampling and studying patients with the same set of uh, deep analysis tools repeatedly over time, which gives us that dimension of time uh, as, as one additional way to look at this. We uh, now, uh, through a lot of refinement, uh, are able to run our full, what we call our pipeline of tests on as little as uh, 10 mils or less of blood uh, and, um, and can generate uh, uh, all of the data. And of course, once that data rolls off, um, it's, there's a massive amount of data which requires a lot of computational effort to, to um, uh, understand and to uh, correlate between these different dimensions and these different data streams. Now, our, at the Allen Institute for Immunology, we are looking at um, this longitudinal profiling of healthy individuals 
uh, in three different age groups. So a uh, young uh, sort of early uh, preteen teen uh, cohort of uh, patients or uh, subjects, I should say. Uh, and then two adult uh, cohorts of subjects, a young adult cohort, 25 to 35 years of age, and a senior cohort, 55 to 65 years of age. Um, we're also looking uh, and comparing with these uh, healthy controls a number of disease states. So uh, in, we're uh, studying patients with multiple myeloma, patients with ref refractory multiple myeloma, patients with melanoma who are undergoing therapy with checkpoint inhibitors, patients with uh, pre-rheumatoid arthritis. So these are individuals who have biomarkers that they may, may develop rheumatoid arthritis but haven't yet developed active disease. And lastly, um, uh, uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And our most recent cohort of patients is uh, patients with COVID-19. Now, um, who are we working with to do this? So we are deeply indebted uh, to our collaborators who are at clinical sites that are gathering the patients. As many of you know, we, the Allen Institute is not a hospital. Uh, we don't have clinics. And so we work closely with this group of collaborators and partners to do this work. So the Benaroya Research Institute is collecting the adult healthy cohorts. Um, a collaboration between the University of Colorado and UC San Diego are collecting the pre-rheumatoid arthritis cohorts. Pediatric healthy cohorts, melanoma and IBD are collected by uh, John Wary and colleagues at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, multiple myeloma by our colleagues uh, at the uh, at the Hutch uh, uh, with uh, Damian Green, who's a, uh, uh, has deep expertise in uh, the clinical care of multiple myeloma and um, and uh, the study of that, along with informatics in Raphael's lab and and deep expertise around deep um, profiling in uh, both Phil and Evan's labs, uh, and then. Our most recent collaboration established is with Julie McElrath and her collaborating groups at the Hutch uh, studying COVID-19 uh, in a couple of cohorts uh, with uh, her group. And so uh, again, just to recognize all of these collaborators and partners who have worked uh, closely with us and continue to do so to uh, study these cohorts of patients, uh, we uh, are deeply indebted to their efforts. Um, I want to just uh, give you an example of, of what this looks like and, and hammer home one of the points that I made about one of the challenges with human immunology and that this is just a pilot, a little pilot study that we did where six healthy volunteers, there were three males, three females, uh, young adults ages 26 to 38 had weekly blood draws for 10 weeks, and then they underwent this uh, detailed profiling that I've just talked about. So all, uh, all the, the six patients across all 10, point, uh, 10 time points, they had, they had complete blood counts done at the time of the blood draw. They had um, uh, plasma protein profiling. And then we, we selected um, uh, just six time points to do, uh, and four patients really to do the deeper dive, which was the, high dimensional flow cytometry, the single cell RNA sequencing of peripheral blood mononuclear cells and single cell attack sequencing of peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And, um, you know, I, I think really this, this data kind of highlights um, what uh, the point I made about humans being outbred and each individual being slightly different. So these are again, we're all healthy individuals. And um, this, this is just data from the O-Link uh, uh, plasma proteomics assay. This is an assay where uh, uh, just uh, uh, about 1,200 proteins are interrogated, and they're interrogated using this unique um, proximity extension assay approach. Uh, that's, uh, and um, this is, uh, this, the data was analyzed by Miriam Gutschow and our group. And I think uh, what I want to point out is this is a Tiesney plot uh, of each of the individual's uh, cumulative data from the proteomics. And, and what it shows is that each individual is highly consistent over the 10 weeks of blood draws. They cluster very nicely together, but each individual has their own unique signature and they sit apart in, uh, as we look at their uh, PCAs on, on this, on this Tiesney plot. So, so the, the, again, the idea that these are outbred humans um, 
They, uh, each of them is healthy, but each of them has their own unique profile. And if you look here at just ex an example of one, of one protein that's in this, in, in this assay, uh, you know, each individual uh, here again by color has a different amount of this particular protein, uh, and uh, but, but it's fairly consistent for that one individual over time. Um, this uh, is borne out uh, looking at other uh, assays in the pipeline, and so uh, these are th these are their complete blood counts uh, drawn weekly, and so you see that over time, the you know doesn't change much over ten weeks. Um, uh, there's a little blip here in in this red patient, maybe. Uh, in, in the neutrophil counts, maybe they had a little uh, infection then, uh, we're not sure, but uh, you know, for the most part, they're quite stable. And when we do uh, the deep flow cytometry and we look at a variety of different cell types, again, each individual here coded by color is stable over time, but they're each different from one another in terms of the relative numbers of the populations of these cells. And similarly, uh, shown by single cell uh, RNA sequencing, uh, just quantitating the cell numbers, uh, again, same pattern emerges. So the idea here is that um, each individual, again, is different, uh, but they are stable over time. And, and so we feel strongly that really the added, the added um, uh, um, aspect of studying patients longitudinally over time really adds that dimension that allows each individual to almost be their own internal control for the study. So just in summary, uh, here at the Allen Institute for Immunology, we're using multiple sensitive omics approaches to perform deep multidimensional profiling of the human immune system in humans. And so I think that's really the key thing here. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to do human immunology, but these technologies have made it possible. And the thing that we are really focusing on is translation. Uh, we're performing longitudinal profiling uh, if, at wherever possible to add this extra dimension to our studies. We're pro performing pi uh, pilot and, and um, hypothesis-driven work uh, to uh, do deep investigation in these new hypotheses. And we've only been up and running for about 18 months. And so we're generating a lot of data very quickly and we're growing. And so there's going to be a lot more to come. And I'm going to uh, just uh, use that to preface this quote uh, from Kobe Bryant. Uh, this was something he said after game two of the Western Conference Finals in 2002. Uh, the Lakers went on to win the NBA championship and, and after game two they'd lost it and Kobe said, you know, this party's just getting started. This is where the fun starts. And, uh, and so I think um, that's certainly the case here. And I, I want to just end with this quote actually from Paul Allen. Um, who, uh, of course, uh, was alive when the Institute was established, but subsequently um, uh, passed away of complications of, of uh, cancer. And this was hit really the task that we were given, which is, he said, I want to see us go beyond interesting correlations and descriptions of new unprecedented data. We seem to be pretty good at that. Let, let us really commit to the reverse engineering and modeling with biology that will lead to real advances in disease mechanisms. So, you know, for us as an institute, our focus is on translation and um, translatable hypotheses, and, and that's really where we're he headed. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Troy. We're now gonna hand it over to Chris. We will, uh, we have a couple questions for Troy, but we are running short on time, so we'll save those for the end. Uh, thanks for the introduction. That's a, uh, this is a nice segue into uh, thinking about human research and the possibility to the challenges that we're now experiencing during the coronavirus pandemic. And I'll just give you the experience from cystic fibrosis because that's the disease that I study specifically. I'll try to forward these slides. So I just want to give everyone, I think most people in Washington state have been following this as in other states. This is just our current COVID challenges. Um, in blue, in this blue diagram is uh, our, our statewide cases per day. And this is from the Washington Department of Health. And this, sir, we had a fairly robust, what we thought, bump of cases in April. 
um, that necessitated a shutdown of the state um, and actually a shutdown of research in, in many aspects, uh, particularly human research. And then uh, we started, uh, the, the curve declined and then we started to open up and now we've seen a, a really quite a dramatic surge again of cases now exceeding the cases we had um, uh, during, uh, during the early part of the pandemic. And again, if you remember early in the case that the, the first person to uh, what we thought at the time to die of COVID-19 was in Washington state. Um, and down here in the right-hand corner, orange is King County. We have a lot fewer cases than the state where obviously we're the, the county with most states uh, cases. And we've had a big peak early in, uh, uh, in March and April that then uh, plateaued, da went down quite a bit and now is peaking up again. And again, these new increases are concerning us for our ability to keep doing clinical research. Um, and we've had terrible hotspots of Yakima, Washington, where um, uh, several weeks ago, they had a positivity rate of 30% of all COVID-19 tests sent. Um, or, uh, uh, and that's really challenging. So what was the status of our hospital? Well, as we as we sort of went into this trough, we closed our COVID ICU, which had been open just to take care of COVID patients. We had a floor COVID unit that also closed. Um, however, now our total UW hospital system last uh, just this week, we had 19 acute care patients and 16 ICU patients. We're still well below our peak, but we're likely going up again. So uh, I study cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis is one of the most common life-threatening uh, single gene disorders. It's caused by a mutation in CFTR um, that causes a host uh, defect in airway surface liquid and also mucous gland abnormalities in the respiratory epithelium. And it leads to chronic lung infections uh, um, that also lead to the progressive destruction of the lung called bronchiectasis. Um, the median survival right now in CF uh, in 2018 was about 47 years. Uh, when I started in 1997, it was 28 years of life. Um, that, again, this represents a patient population at particular risk of coronavirus infection. Um, so how has it infected our, affected our patient population? Well, we have a group, the uh, uh, CF patient registry chairs around the world. I'm, one of the re I'm the registry chair of the US CF patient registry. And we have uh, tried to harmonize our, our, um, our registries and ask similar questions whenever new uh, disease problems pop up. Um, and so we create a standardized collections uh, form uh, to follow and track uh, uh, confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infections. And we did this from February 1st to, to April 13th. And uh, interestingly, this, this included countries like the US, UK, France, Canada, Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, and the Netherlands. And we only found uh, 40 cases at that time in all those countries um, and no deaths. Um, and the estimated incidence in this disease was only 0.07% compared to the uh, participating countries' uh, incidence of coronavirus infection was 0.515% of all their patient populations. But the numbers are still going up and we're doing an ongoing collection of coronavirus cases in this uh, susceptible population. There are now 81 patients now in the United States with two deaths. And how does that affect research? Well, we have a very well-structured uh, uh, well research system to study CF. Um, this is a map of the United States and all these blue dots are our therapeutics development net network centers. And we use these centers to develop drugs, do observational studies, collect biospecimens, um, and, uh, um, and improve clinical care and drug development in CF patients. Uh, the, the little triangles are part of resource centers and these are um, noted at many centers around the United States. Our resource center here is in microbiology where we carefully study Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa and other bacteria that infect the lungs of CF. And the coordinating center that runs the whole network, and this is the coordinating center that I currently run, is here in uh, Seattle Children's Hospital um, uh, at the university within, uh, within the Seattle Research, uh, 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 Seattle Hospital Research Institute. And this is all funded by the CF Foundation, which is in Bethesda. So this network provides us a rapid, uh, a rapid ability to assess the impact of new uh, barriers and challenges to clinical research. So we've been doing monthly surveys since the on, on, onset of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. We started in February uh, of all of our sites and really got going. Uh, we sent them to every research center in the country. We have a 100% response rate. 
And we're actually able to see right away what the impact of this uh, pandemic has been on our research activities. This is the first question we asked to the centers. Um, are any members of the CF research team under work from home or shelter from restrictions? And this is over time. It takes you from actually April to June. As you can see these bars at the beginning, almost only, uh, so 85% of our centers were all in work from home or shelter in place. And this has, this has dropped to now in June, 65% of our centers are work from home. So that means 34% of our centers are now increasing their uh, activity and no longer work from home restrictions. We had other important questions because we do drug trials we, and how do they keep going? Um, so as of today, we asked if, our, if the institutions, what were they allowing? Um, so home research visits was actually interesting. They about stayed, stayed about the same. We're allowed to do those and most of the centers are allowed to do those about 30% 30, 30 to 40% of the centers are allowed to do those. Um, home research conducted by a research coordinator is a little different, that's a lot less. Um, Currently enrolled subjects attending research visits um, uh, limited to only research. This is sort of clinical research visits. Um, they were littered to very essential. So about uh, most of our centers have restricted research visits. Um, enrolling subjects in clinical uh, research visits and allowed to attend research, research visits, that's actually climbed from only 11% really in April, which was really the midst of the early pandemic in the Northeast. Um, now it's 67%. With this, we've done amazing amounts of remote monitoring. So now um, almost 90 to 95% of all the patients are being remotely monitored while in clinical trials. And that has replaced on-site visits. And on-site monitoring, meaning uh, sponsors can come to the University of Washington and review uh, drug trial data, is now only allowed in about 17% of the centers. So are there restrictions to sporing spirometry in the units? And, and uh, CF affects the lungs, so spirometry has been, um, uh, is a critical endpoint in all our clinical trials. And what you're noting now is actually still, it's not being done uh, very much restricted. It's considered an aerosolizing procedure that could spread uh, coronavirus. So still about two thirds, uh, I mean, three quarters of all of our centers are not able to do spirometry uh, within the study unit. So, the question is, how do we deal with the fact that our primary endpoint can no longer be monitored carefully in, in clinic? Um, and the question was, could your sites use home spirometry for clinical, uh, for clinical care? Um, and it turns out uh, at the beginning, almost no one did. 80% did not do home spirometry. And now almost 80% uh, do do home spirometry as of June. So there's a rapid uptake of using these devices in patients' homes to capture key clinical uh, values. So are there any issues with remote assessments? And we have started a project that we're in the midst of, uh, which is using, we took data from a prior study that did home assessments to trigger clinical care. Um, and it's important to understand when you shift how you're measuring an outcome measure, how it might affect your trial. And so this is uh, unpublished data yet, but it's being su it's submitted and accepted for a uh, uh, presentation at the North American virtual CF meeting. Um, and what it shows is prime, lung function is our primary outcome. And this is, actually the, this is actually the change in lung function over time from z month zero to month three in a clinical trial. This is, um, and then from month six to nine in the existing data that we had. And what it shows in orange is when we do it in the clinic, and these were spirometry values done both in clinic and at home, uh, approximating in time within about two to three days. The variability of home spirometry was much larger. We can account for that. That's, that and uh, the, there's a little bit of a biased assessment of the actual value. However, over time, the variability increased even more. It increased both in the clinical, vari the clinic variable, but really in dramatically in the home assessment. And this variability, if you're only looking at lung function as your endpoint, it makes a clinical trial, a uh, clinical trial sample size uh, uh, way uh, double much more than a current. So you'd have to enroll twice as many people to see the effects you are hoping to see using clinic spirometry. So I think newer spirometers are being added. We're trying coaching to improve this, but we're trying to sort of take advantage of this sort of uh, groundswell of change in care to see if we can find a system by which we can actually monitor patients much more carefully at home. What have we done at the University of Washington? Well, clinical care, it's interesting. We rapidly transitioned to telehealth. Um, 
and then April 2020, we uh, the UW credentialed over 2,500 providers in telehealth. We conducted over 27,000 telehealth encounters. And in comparison, in the prior April, I think we'd only done 350 telehealth encounters in a month. Um, our CF clinic has led the specialty clinics in UW at UW converting to clinical uh, to telehealth. Um, uh, there was tremendous concern, particularly in our patient population, of attending in-person visits. What happened to research? Well, the translational research unit here at the University of Washington remained open. Um, there, were, there were a number of key restrictions. They allowed ongoing clinical trial visits uh, for therapeutic interventions, um, but they were asked to leverage remote assessments. Um, there were no non-COVID observational research, so non-COVID observational research was stopped and there were um, uh, no uh, new trials uh, were started. However, uh, it has really, we've taken this opportunity to, I think, use the, the pandemic to try to uh, uh, change our approach to research. Um, in the interim, uh, our staff here at the University of Washington have established our remote consenting process for our studies. Uh, we've enhanced home collection of sputum and biospecimens. So we have, uh, we have uh, nurses and also uh, staff uh, go to the patient's uh, uh, home and do the collection and bring them into the clinic. Um, we've also, again, used this fairly robust uh, home spirometry program and we're trying to do a careful analytical assessment of its effect on our outcomes and studies. Um, here is our current status is that we're, we're, we're each research group at the University of Washington is, is, uh, has, has their own reopening plan. Um, we're allowed to do interventional trials now as long as we uh, re leverage remote procedures and collection. Um, we're allowed to do phase two and phase three clinical trials and we can now enroll them and start them. Uh, phase one trials can occur if the medical condition will inevitably or directly cause devastating physical cognitive impairment and or death. So research has once again opened up um, at our center. So the future, what are we gonna do about this case rebound? And we're not sure yet, we're watching and waiting. At the moment, there are no plans to go back to a more restrictive process, but uh, we're clearly figuring out how to uh, leverage home assessments and home collection over in hospital and in clinic collections. Um, I th do think the coronavirus pandemic has led us uh, likely to remain a challenge for months to come. Um, certainly the resurgence we've seen in King County and Washington State is very concerning. So with that, I'll close and, and um, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. We have time for one question for you, Chris. Um, has the network conducted surveys looking at the patient experience in receiving care during the pandemic? For example, their experience with the switch to home spirometry. Um, that's a great question, and the answer is it's ongoing. So um, uh, I'm working with a team that's uh, that has launched a, a, a web-based uh, system to assess the impact on care um, in Canada, and then there's a separate group uh, that I've been in collaboration with at the University of Washington at the CF uh, Foundation, um, leveraging their extensive outreach into the community uh, to uh, see the impact on patients. I think CF patients are very good at self-isolating uh, when, when they've been around people who are sick, um, but it has, I think, is having a profound effect on care um, and certainly interactions with staff. Um, there are certainly things that are that uh, are challenging to do while um, conducting a, a home visit that are that are much uh, much more readily done uh, within the clinic. They do like not coming to clinic, having to travel to clinic. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's hand it over to Park. Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you again for the SLU Collaborative for having me. Um, again, my name is Parth Shah. I am an assistant professor um, in the Public Health Sciences Division and with HICOR at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And what's kind of nice about me um, presenting last is that these presentations kind of went through the research translational pipeline. We started first with um, the basic science with immunology and then moved into clinical research. And now I want to talk a little bit about human subjects research in, um, in what I would call like human and societal systems and specifically focusing on community pharmacies, which is um, the contextual area in which I do human subjects research. Um, but before I dive into some of the human subject considerations I take, 
Um, I wanted to spend the first half of my presentation motivating some of the research and um, why I believe it's really important within the translational pipeline to be thinking about um, the research that I do, which is implementation research. And then the second half, I'll uh, talk very, very broadly about some of the human subject considerations I take when conducting implementation research in community pharmacies. So the first question that I pose to the group is, um, what is implementation science? And this is a, just a general definition that, is, um, that frames the work that I do. Implementation research is a scientific study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings to improve patient outcomes and benefits, um, and benefits population health. So what, what really does that mean? So there's certain assumptions in implementation science which, um, which we hold true. Um, the first thing that implementation science is about is clinician behavior, um, and specifically clinician behavior change within organizational constraints. Now we talk about the individual clinician, but you can also think about organizational behavior. So the clinic behavior, how the collective behavior within a clinic confers certain types of health outcomes or even within larger systems. The second assumption that we take in implementation science is context is not seen as a nuisance to us. In clinical research and efficacy and effectiveness research, we do a very, very, um, we, we are very attentive to randomization, to controlling any type of um, spurious effects that could confound um, our exposure to our health outcomes. But in implementation research, we're actually really interested in the context. And in many cases, the context are our main predictors or exposures to actually understand some of the processes that we're looking at. And then finally, the last sort of truth in implementation science is that there is an evidence-based thing in innovation and intervention, a medical device, a therapeutic target um, that can be implemented. So thinking again, sort of where implementation research fits, I thought this sort of subway schematic is a nice way to think about implementation science, um, juxtaposed to the typical clinical research that maybe most of you are more familiar with. So starting at the first note on this red line, you know, research can identify a practice of interest. And when we get to the next node, we see, well, does, does, has, does this practice of interest actually show efficacy. If it doesn't, you would do efficacy research. If it does, then you'd go on to this next node. Well, okay, if it's shown efficacy, does it show effectiveness in real world? If no, you would do effectiveness research. If it's no or partial, you would do what's called a hybrid design. Um, this, these are designs that are starting to become really popular in implementation research. Or if the evidence base is really, really strong for this practice, then we would just kind of go through the traditional implementation research design, which involves mixed method studies to understand context, designing implementation strategies that facilitate the adoption or implementation of the practice of interest, and then finally testing implementation strategies. So why should we care about DNI research? Let's take for instance that we have this innovation or therapeutic of treatment that is shown to be 100% effective in clinical research, right? An evidence-based practice is only as good as how and whether it is adopted, practitioners are trained to deliver it, trained practitioners choose to deliver it, eligible populations receive it, and it can be sustained. Now let's assume that there's a 50% threshold to these steps here. What this kind of shows is that even though you have 100% effective innovation, if you have a 50% adoption rate, you have a 50% of practitioners trained to use it and so on and so forth, in reality, we're only actually seeing 3% of the benefits of, of these innovations being created. And this is why implementation research is so fundamentally important in trying to understand how do we actually push the practice paradigms and move the needle on population health. So then this gets into the second piece of like why I like to think about pharmacies as my context to do implementation research. 
and um, what evidence-based practices would fit within the pharmacy uh, context, uh, translate into the pharmacy context. I'll focus on one in particular. So pharmacies are an interesting place to do healthcare research, mainly because of accessibility and convenience. Um, pharmacies are by far the most accessible healthcare setting in the United States. Around 90% of US residents will live within five miles of a pharmacy. And pharmacies compared to traditional clinics, primary care clinics, hospitals, et cetera, tend to be a little bit more convenient for patients to get to. They have longer operating hours, they have shorter wait times, and usually you can talk to a pharmacist without an appointment. These confer some significant contextual advantages for implementing certain types of evidence-based practices in pharmacies. Now, the one that I'm particularly interested in is human papillomavirus or HPV vaccination. Now, many of you may be familiar with HPV vaccination. It is a highly, highly, highly effective vaccine in preventing a variety of HPV um, serotypes, which are um, known causes of significant cancer burdens that are attributed to HPV. But in the United States, we are doing a really, really poor job of implementing vaccination for, for this particular vaccine for boys and girls. Um, the last data that I saw was around 50%. However, with the coronavirus pandemic, we're seeing that the use of preventive medicines like HP vaccination is precipitously dropping, like anywhere between 25 to 40%, depending on which region you're looking at. So this presents a really important implementation challenge. So going back to my initial premise, in plain language, what I'm interested in is HP vaccination is the thing I'm trying to implement. Implementation strategies are the stuff we do to try to help people places do HP vaccination. You can think of any variety of strategies that could work like audits and feedbacks, reminder recalls, things like that. And the main out uh, implementation outcomes um, are how much and how well pharmacists do HP vaccination. So slightly different than the typical therapeutic or clinical outcomes we tend to look at in clinical research. So there's a variety of human subjects considerations um, that hold implementation research apart from traditional clinical research. And again, just a reminder, sort of this red box is highlighting that area that I tend to do my research. But um, some, I wanted to highlight some three characteristics that hold implementation research somewhat differently. The first is the unit of analysis. Uh, we tend to focus on providers, clinics, healthcare systems as, um, as our observation. And those observations tend to be nested. Um, and we focus on those types of uh, units rather than the patients. The second consideration is that study outcomes are process oriented rather than clinically oriented. And what that means is we're really interested in clinician behavior as it pertains to adoption, satisfaction with delivering the evidence-based practice, the appropriateness of the different strategies we're using to support the evidence-based practice, the feasibility, et cetera. And then finally, um, there there's, tends to be a tussle between implementation research within implementation research when it gets classified as quality improvement. And this, uh, this concentric circle domain graphic sort of highlights that implementation research um, you know, embodies a variety of different things, but within it is quality improvement science. And making that delineation is actually something that's really critical in trying to understand some of the human subject considerations that I go through. So um, implementation research may not fit well within the traditional human subjects paradigms used to assess clinical trials. And this has been something I've been running into as a new faculty member at the Fred Hutch, where Fred Hutch is very, very familiar with running clinical trials and um, very, has a very um, well-oiled machine in conducting human research in that aspect. However, implementation research doesn't hold itself to the same, um, to the same uh, mandates that clinical trials do. We, we're looking at processes rather than certain types of uh, of uh, efficacy and effectiveness outcomes. And because of that, because of the fact that we're studying human systems and we're studying evidence-based practices that are already out in usual care, typically the risks in our research 
tend to be related to breaches of confidentiality rather than health risks associated with, with traditional clinical trials. And I won't go into this. I, I know we're running a little bit short on time. So um, this is kind of just a table to show when to kind of make a decision about when your research really does fall into true implementation research versus quality improvement. So I'll take, for instance, the second point here, using scientific methods like randomization and uh, into, into various intervention conditions and um, the outcome of the project is uncertain. Well, that's probably gonna have to go through ethical review. While in quality improvement, you may have a very good understanding of the strategy that you're implementing within your system and you know there's a reasonable expectation of uh, success. Well, that's probably not gonna need to go through IRB review. So I'll breeze through this as an example of some of the research that I'm doing. So I, I'm currently working with Bartel Drugs to test a multimodal communication strategy to support HV vaccination in pharmacies. I'm using a mixed methods quasi-experimental design. And just reiterating again, the, the thing I'm implementing is HV vaccination. And I'm using this multimodal communication strategy to help support vaccination and I'm doing it within the context of Bartel, uh, Bartel Drugs Pharmacies. So I have two aims. The first aim is to conduct semi-structured interviews and environmental scans um, to try to understand how to adapt the current systems and processes that can facilitate vaccination in pharmacies. And then the second aim is to actually go ahead and test the impact of my communication strategy in the pharmacies. And you can see for the second aim, I'm using more quantitative methods like surveys and EHR data. So in my study, you know, is my study quality improvement or research? Well, my study is research because I'm directly intervening on the pharmacy staff and asking them to do something different and I have testable hypotheses. And the risks that I tend to see in my research are more psychologically driven, like discomfort with answering questions and then breach of confidentiality, um, so identity of participants being revealed. So those are some of the, the thing considerations that I think about when, um, when doing human subjects research and implementa implementation research. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Parth. We have a question that came in through the Q&A panel. And as a reminder to all attendees, please go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A panel for any of our panelists and make sure you label the question with who it's for. And also to take a look at the answered questions panel to see some of the questions that Chris and Troy have been answering. Uh, so question for Parth, for researchers who want to move into an implementation research approach in their area of study, is there a research, a resource that can help researchers brainstorm the proposed study design? It's such a different way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, um, so we're really fortunate that um, being in Seattle, we're sort of a mecca for implementation research. Um, UW is one of the really, really large institutions, not just in the country, but globally, that does really, really great implementation research. So you can actually type in um, University of Washington Implementation Science, and there's a slew of resources there. NIH has a tremendous emphasis on implementation research, and you can peruse the NIH website too. Um, and NCI, if you do cancer specific research, has very large uh, program of research on DNI work. So they all have a wide variety of um, resources that people can use. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question for all three panelists. How has COVID affected your team's work on your science? Well, uh... Our team was at home for a long time, and that affected us tremendously. Uh, we had to adapt very quickly to, to doing frequent Zoom calls and actually making sure that people had access to appropriate communications, uh, that they had access to the research materials, which is also challenging. We, got, we had to work to get permission for some of them to come in and take research binders home. Um, so it, it's been the first month and or, or six weeks was actually really challenging as we tried to figure out what to do. And now I think we've become more facile in it, but um, uh, we have not had to redeploy people to other settings. Um, our basic science labs did shut down for a while, but they're up and going and now we're getting specimens to them again. So we, I was going to say we had many of the same uh, challenges that Chris highlights. You know, we, in addition to obviously needing to have people work from home and uh, 
deal with those changes. Uh, we, you know, this, our, our collaborator sites that are collecting uh, patient samples, non-essential research uh, was essentially shut down at most of those sites. Um, and so things like, you know, what we're doing where the, you know, their non-interventional studies um, were put on hold. So uh, our sample collection slowed down for a time. That's now beginning to pick back up. Uh, and uh, so that has had impacts for us. Fortunately, we had, you know, we've generated enough data that there was lots of things for people to spend time digging through, but uh, that did have an impact. Yeah, I, um, luckily where the stage is, at, uh, where my research is at, it, I'm doing a lot of observational work right now, um, which really is facilitated um, by working from home. So um, my work hasn't been terribly interrupted. However, as my projects start transitioning to the community intervention work, um, that is going to be a lot trickier. Um, as I work with the pharmacy partners, they have significant concerns of bringing children and their families into the pharmacies to get vaccinated. And those are ongoing conversations I'm having with them. Luckily, the, pro uh, the project that I presented to you won't be doing the intervention component until the spring of next year. Fingers crossed we have vaccines available by that point that people can start coming back into the pharmacy and getting vaccinated. But that is that's going to be a continued struggle within the work I do. And it's going to halt work if, um, if we don't get a handle on the pandemic soon. Thanks, all three of you. The next question is for Parth. What kind of numbers do you need in the subway model to decide the best course to take? Um, so I, I don't think I quite understand what is meant by the numbers. Do yeah, you... I think it means like um, sort of the, the, what you find at each stage. Sure. So I think like to get to the point where you're moving from efficacy to effectiveness to implementation, that's going to be very dependent on the topic and the, the thing that you're studying, right? For vaccinations, you know, we, we tend to look at you know, certain therapeutic endpoints, like did this vaccine prevent the disease um, to what effective rate within the population? Um, I think that's gonna vary a little bit within the context of, of sort of the, 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 the population that you care about. So um, I think um, really here, you need to look at the literature here. Are there systematic reviews or meta-analysis that kind of get you to um, this area where you can start moving away from effectiveness and start thinking about implementation challenges. One thing that we, um, one thing that we're doing in implementation science is this middle piece where we're doing hybrid effectiveness um, and implementation trials. And what that essentially means is once you start moving into effectiveness trials, you are alongside designing implement, you are measuring and designing implementation strategies and outcomes with your clinical effectiveness outcomes. And um, Jeff Curran, G-E-O-F-F-C-U-A-R-R-A-N, he's a very big implementation scientist um, out at University of Arkansas and at the, at the VA. And he's the one who developed this hybrid effectiveness implementation trial model, which I would highly recommend um, any one of you take a look at um, look at that paper. He, he does a really nice job of breaking down how the VA goes about doing those types of trials. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, and then we have one more question for Chris. Uh, are there cases of CF who have been infected with COVID in other countries? Um, and also to add to that, uh, how do you track uh, finding those cases? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So we, we, we in CF are lucky. We have, it's a rare, it's an orphan disease, a rare disease, and uh, all the major developed countries in the world have registries. And we all, the registry chairs all get together. We just, uh, when patients are seen, when clinicians, we add new questions to our registry and all the providers all over Germany, France, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, uh, will quickly start answering those questions. Um, and there are more cases. Uh, I think the United States now leads the world with our over 80 cases. We'll have another publication coming out in the next uh, two weeks. We're doing these very timely turnaround publications to inform the CF community of the number of patients. 
Um, it's still relatively rare in this disease compared to um, some of the you know, incidence and prevalence rates we're seeing in, in places like Arizona and Texas and, and in our own uh, county of Yakima um, and Benton County. So, um, but we're, the nice thing for this is it, for CF is we're very interlinked and very coordinated. The timing of a calls is always the same. It's uh, 4 30 in the morning, West Coast time. Um, and every two weeks, I'm on a call with all the registries of the world. And now for our next one, we have Brazil, Chile. Um, we've actually added all of Europe. We've added Russia. And so we now have a collaborative ability to actually track these cases by collecting data every week from clinics all over the world. Um, and it, it's, it's a nice model to figure out how you, I mean, a lot of what's happening is in CF is, is to make sure that we can actually reach out to our community and tell them, is it, how big a problem is it, is it and how do, we, how do we track it as, as the pandemic continues? But again, it, it has to do with very careful collection of data. And so we, definitions of who has the disease. And, um, and there's also a big effort soon. We have long, large, large-scale observational studies, we'll be doing antibody studies on the blood that we've collected for other studies, as many groups will do, to understand the, the un, you know, undiagnosed COVID-19 um, and uh, coronavirus infections that have happened in the population. So we have many before, we have during, and we'll have after, so. Thank you. Well, many thanks to all three of our presenters today. Uh, Ernie? Yeah, thank you very much to our presenters and thank you uh, for attending the SLU Collaborative Seminar. For more information about the series, please visit slucollaborative.org for more virtual events from the Allen Institute. Please visit alleninstitute.org and click on events. And as always, we thank the founder of the Allen Institute, Paul G. Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. So with that, have a good evening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you.